Ready, so bay. Always wanted to say that. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for having us. As you know, most presentations are boring, and this is not an exception. However, as, I, as we know that you guys are kind of busy to go to get your ass to the bar, we try to condensate the most important part in about 20 seconds. BitLock, BitLocker enabled computer, and it's you logging into your computer. So if you want to know what happened before that, um, stay around for, for the next 40 minutes or so. So we are the Penn and Teller of InfoSec, um, except that we are not rich, funny, uh, or, or anything like that. Um, and the short guy actually talks. And like with Penn and Teller, the short guy is also the one who has all the skills. Um, as a day job, we both work for F-Secure, uh, doing cyber consultancy or infosec consultancy, if you will. And the reason why we actually started doing this originally is that we do a lot of incident response work. And in addition to that, we do a lot of red teaming. And we noticed that it's actually a reasonably difficult field to work on because most of the tooling is always broken. And even if you think that the tooling, tooling isn't broken, it still is broken. So in the past, it was reasonably easy. Back in the days, this is an age verification test. How many of you actually know what this is? Good. So we're not underaged here. So um, back in the day, it was really, really simple. You had a hard drive, you cloned that hard drive, you basically took bit-to-bit -to -bit copy of it, and then you examined that copy or that clone of that hard disk. However, nowadays, it's a bit more complicated. The complexity has gone up the roof. Everything is virtualized. You have virtualized switches, you have uh, data storages, you have virtualized computers, everything. By now, there is not a single guy who actually can explain to you the whole stack that goes from the hardware up to the layer 8. Also, downtime costs tons of money. Even the most basic system, we, we are living the cloud dream, right? So even the most basic system can cost you easily tens of thousands of euros if it goes down. So if you're trying to take an image of that disk that happens to be like 200, gigabytes or something, it might cost you more than the whole thing is abs uh, absolutely even worth. The amount of data has gone up the roof as well. So it's not really practical to take bit-to-bit -bit copies of everything anymore. So you needed to have different kinds of solutions for this. Volatile data. Taking these images is not really the thing anymore because you're losing all the volatile data. Process lists, routing tables, all that, all those things that actually make a difference. And modern exploitation techniques as well. So you have things like Metapreter. 
they don't really, really leave that much to look at on the disk anymore. You might find a stub or the original exploitation vector, but that's about it. So the obvious solution to these issues was originally memory forensics. However, there are huge challenges when it comes to memory forensics. First of all, it's truly an error-prone process. It's very, very common that when you're trying to take a, take a memory dump of something, you actually end up blue screening the device and you're losing all the evidence at the same time. But it's also very, very specific to the OS. So if you have ever tried to take a memory dump out of a Linux computer, you have to compile the exact same version of, of your tooling that the operating system is running. So, so the kernel version has to match to the last decimal. Uh, there are also lots of other issues related to that, but I'm not going to cover those challenges here. Many have been suggesting <coughs> that you could solve these issues with direct memory access tooling. And there are some very, very impressive tools available there. The issue is that those only take the memory dump of the first, eight, uh, first, first four gigabytes. And then you have to inject a kernel driver in order to get the, the rest of the memory. Not very practical and also can cause a lot of issues there as well. So our approach had to tackle these issues. The way we decided to solve the problem was to implement an attack that's already 10 years ago. About a decade ago, um, researchers from Princeton University came up with an attack called cold boot. And what that simply means in practice for us is that we've created a piece of bootable code. We run that code, and then that code extracts disk encryption keys from memory. More precisely, what we do is when we get our hands on the computer, we first power it off and then immediately power it back on. Then we boot the system from our code, typically from a USB stick, but equally we could use a network boot as well. And when the code runs, it extracts the disk, encryp disk encryption keys from memory. But what makes this possible? I mean, most people, when they learn computers, one of the first things they learn is that if you don't want to lose your data when you power off your computer, you need to save it. Because the content of RAM will be gone when you power off the system. Well, that's kind of true. Yes, some of the data will be gone, but if you just power off the system, for a very short period of time and then immediately power it on again, you will lose only some of the content of the memory. Meaning that some of the bits will have values different from the original, but most of the bits will actually still have the original values. And that's what makes it possible. Like I already mentioned, the attack itself, called cold boot attack, it's, it's not invented by us. This was discovered already 10 years ago. What we did was we simply implemented the attack. Uh, there are plenty of challenges <laughs> if, you, if you want to make this work. In theory, it sounds very straightforward, but trust me, it took a lot of work to get this working. Um, one of the first questions you might have is that, OK, I can access the memory, but how do I find the encryption keys? from memory. Um, a very popular approach in academic papers is that um, you search for the key schedule. So for example, in AES encryption algorithm, you have multiple rounds, and every round has a separate key. And the nice thing about the key schedule is that it gives you basically metadata. It gives you additional context. So you know that, OK, somewhere around here, you most likely have the encryption key. However, if you want to test each and every offset from the memory to check whether there's a key schedule at that offset, um, it's slow. 
So I, I wanted to optimize the performance, and what I did with BitLocker was I, I searched for certain pool tags. Uh, what pool tags are, they, uh, those are four byte identifiers used by the Windows kernel to mark memory allocations. So you know that if you see a specific pool tag, there's a specific purpose for that memory area. And by looking for certain pool tags, you can pretty much narrow it down that somewhere around here you should have the disk encryption keys. And this is a significant, significant um, performance boost. This is actually something that's already done um, in some volatility plugins, for example. So again, not my original idea. Maybe the biggest challenge in this whole thing is that some of the bits won't have their original values, which makes even the most simple things pretty challenging. For example, let's say you have a four-byte pool deck that you're searching for. You, you cannot simply compare the strings because some of the bits have flipped, and obviously you don't know which ones. So you need to come up with something more elegant. And in our tool, the role of the AES key schedule is to compensate for the bits that have flipped. And what I mean by that is that because you cannot know which bits of the key have the wrong value, then you can look at the AES key schedule, and then you can try different values for those bits and see, OK, if I have this combination of bits, it actually results in pretty much the same key schedule. And now you need to remember that also the key schedule will have bit flips. So this is quite a pain in the ass, but it's doable. In some of my tests, um, I think the worst case I had was that 25% um, of the bits in the key had the wrong value. And that's still, still doable. Then one of the challenges I, I, I'd like to discuss is the temperature. If you have read the academic papers about cold boot, many of them, I would even say all of them, discuss the role of the temperature for the attack. Uh, and some people mistakenly think that um, the name cold boot comes from the fact that in some of the attacks you freeze the memory. But no, the word cold in the cold boot refers to the fact that you do a cold reboot. So you power the computer down and then power it back on. Based on my tests, the temperature doesn't really play that big of a role. So what you saw, well, you didn't see it on the video yet, but what you may see soon on the video is that there's a cold boot attack done, and that attack is done at room temperature. There's no need to freeze the memories based, based on the limited testing that I've done. So you can get this attack to work at room temperature. If bit flips <laughs> are a pain in the ass, this is, <laughs> this is an even bigger pain in the ass. Modern processors do something called memory scrambling. And I'll explain it briefly. Here you have three layers. The topmost layer is, is your operating system application, whatever. The one in the middle is the integrated memory controller, part of the CPU. And then at the bottom, you have the physical memory cells. So let's say you're writing a pattern like that to memory. What happens behind the scenes is that the integrated memory controller XORs that using a certain pattern. And the stuff that ends up to the memory, to the physical memory cells, is different from the one that you use on the operating system or application layer. The reason why you probably haven't heard of any of this is that when you read the data back, there's an automatic descrambling for the data. So this is totally transparent, even for the operating system. And typically, you don't, you don't need to worry about any of this. However, 
the scrambler, scrambler has a key. And what I mean by that is that on every boot, the key or the seed changes. And what happens then is that if you have written some data to the memory, then you power down the computer, you power it up as quickly as you can, there will be a new seed for the scrambler. Meaning that the scrambler will use a different XOR pattern when you read the data back. So instead of getting the original data back, you get basically garbage. And obviously, the beauty of all this is that this is done by the CPU. There are some patents. It's somewhat documented that there is a feature like this, but it's not documented. The algorithm is not public. It's based on a linear feed shift register or something like that, LFSR. But nobody really knows how it works. So this is one of the things that you need to deal with if you want to implement a cold boot attack on a modern CPU. So if we look at the use cases here. So if you have a live operating system running, so basically all the tooling you need to have, it's, it's kind of um, hardware independent and, and carries all these other properties. With cold boot, you get this, and with warm boot, you get this. The notable thing here is that basically the only case where it actually makes sense to use cold boot is if you want to get access to the disk encryption keys. So this is not an operating system specific attack. It should work across all the major operating systems. So if you actually did, if you're doing lots of forensics work or incident response work, uh, the live option is actually pretty good, but there are many cases where you can't really use it, especially if you're doing offensive stuff. So to actually give you a better explanation how that previous video or the previous attack was carried off, you can see it here. So first of all, this is the victim booting up his computer, logging in the computer, and showing that there is a secret file there. That's the contents of that file. And then, as we always do, we take a look at our BitLocker encryption settings. And this is the hardened version. So this is even the stronger configuration that Microsoft actually recommends. Then we come to your hotel room, plug in our USB stick, power it off very, very briefly, and power it on immediately after that. Then we go to the boot menu and just enable booting from that USB stick. So it doesn't have to be a USB stick. It can be a Pixie boot or whatever. We scan through the memory and try to find uh, or try to see if we can recognize the pattern that is being used for that specific power cycle. And it's, it's pretty quick to do. Then it, once we know the scrambling pattern, we search for all the encryption keys in the memory, also the kind of encryption keys that might be use, useful for later on. Once we have identified the whole memory space, this is eight gigabyte system, and it takes about 50 seconds to go through eight gigabytes of memory. So it's reasonably fast. And once the whole memory has been processed and we have identified that we have two encryption keys, it boots uh, to our custom Linux installation and tries those uh, identified encryption keys and tries to use those to mount the existing file system, so the BitLocker encrypted volume. And once that's the contents of the secret file, and it also says implant added. And now when the victim logs into the computer, it's a standard boot procedure. You enter the BitLocker pin in order to get access to your hard disk.
and then you log into your computer. And then you see our implant. That's basically what happened. Okay, a few words about the implementation on how we did it. The custom piece of code that runs from the USB stick is an EFI application. And there are some open source tools that work if you have a BIOS, so the traditional way of booting the computer. There are some pieces of assembly that work if you use a BIOS boot. But if you need to use a computer that has EFI, then as far as I know, there are no open source alternatives. And to be honest with you, the main reason why this was originally built as an EFI application was that the original target that we had, it didn't have any BIOS at all. So EFI was the option to use. And there are some um, pretty significant benefits compared to writing your code using assembly for a BIOS-based computer compared to building an EFI application. For example, in an EFI application, you have file system access. So if you want to write files to the USB stick or read files, there are ready-made functions or protocols, how those are called in EFI programming. Um, that makes it a lot easier to get going. The hard part for me personally was simply to get a working development environment. I spent probably a day just doing that. And this website was very helpful. Uh, honestly, this was the first EFI application that I wrote. It's just copy pasted from that website. And on that same website, you even have a make file. So once you build your first EFI application, many of the EFI programming things after that are fairly easy. The memory scrambling part, I already described some of the things to you. Um, if you want to understand it better, I recommend reading this paper. So the way the scrambling works is somewhat studied. The nice thing about this paper is that there is like a mathematical formula that you can use to verify a 64-byte pattern to check whether it looks like a memory scrambling pattern or not. And, and that's pretty useful, because if you want to spot the pattern from the memory, it's nice to have some sort of a simple test to check that is this even a potential memory scrambling pattern. And that helped the development a lot. Like I said, the paper describes the scrambling pretty well. But if you want to do de-scrambling, then that is something I, I leave as an exercise for the reader. There, there are multiple different approaches you could take. I think I did five different iterations before I was happy with the one that I got, because you need to keep in mind that the EFI application that you build, um, ours is about 60 kilobytes, which is not that bad. But you, you cannot build an application that allocates memory like crazy. Because if you start like using hundreds of megabytes of memory, it might happen that you actually overwrite the encryption keys from the memory. So when you build an algorithm for descrambling of memory, you probably want something that doesn't really take that much memory. And it's, it's a nice exercise. OK. So how can you prevent this? How can you protect your computer from this? And honestly, the only method I know is to use non-vulnerable hardware. I don't know of any other method that you could use to prevent this attack. And maybe worth noting here is that by non-vulnerable hardware, we actually mean that the memory management unit or the memory management controller 
has to be a certain type. So what we noticed during the testing that you can take identical computers and some of them are vulnerable and some of the others are not. So you don't really have a way of knowing it before you actually test it against this. There are some mitigations, however, that you can implement. And one of them is, is setting a biased password, because, well, this is very important. If you don't have a biased password set, then the attacker can go to the BIOS and change the boot order, disable secure boot, whatnot. So it's, it's recommended to set the password. Because if you don't have it, the attacker could just disable the other protections that you have. How many of you are familiar with this website? Only a few hands. On this website, you can take the computer's serial number, and it will generate you a BIOS password that you can use to access BIOS. It's, it's basically a backdoor password. Not all laptops are affected, but at least I've had great success with Dell laptops. The site is bios-pw.org. You should try it out. Uh, even with the Dell systems, there's a very specific sequence that you need to do so that the password works. But when you get it right, it, it does work. So those of you who think that, OK, I have a really strong Pios password, and then the hardware is really well hardened, well, you might want to think again. The BIOS password might be easier to bypass than you think. And obviously, there are other methods, but this is by far the easiest. And we are not going to name any names here, but all the Dell computers are vulnerable. <laughs> that, that, that is, I'm glad you find it funny, but yeah, <laughs> that's, that is the case. We've tested with the latest, latest BIOS versions and even with the latest bias, the passwords from this site do work. And it's not even that hard to reverse engineer the bias to discover the algorithm. OK. One thing you should do is allow booting from the primary hard drive only. Because if you allow boot from USB or network, you're making the attacker's life too easy. So just limit booting to the primary hard drive only. Um, I haven't tried it yet, but at least on some laptops, it should be possible to just take the primary hard drive out and replace it with the attacker's hard drive. And then you probably could still do the attack. And obviously, if you get access to BIOS, this doesn't matter. Secure boot doesn't matter either, if you can just disable it in BIOS. And the nice thing about secure boot is that I actually tested this this week. Um, there is co something called EFI shim, um, which is basically a simple component which is signed by a trusted signer that then loads another computer that you can use to manage something called machine owner keys. And what you can do with these two components is that you can enroll your own hashes or keys, which means you can whitelist your own EFI application. So if you use the shim and the machine owner key manager, you can whitelist your own EFI application. And after that, even if the computer has secure boot enabled, you can still do the attack. And the nice thing about the shim and the MOK manager is that those are both signed by a trusted signer, or at least the first component, which means that you can run those tools even if the computer has secure boot enabled. So maybe secure boot isn't <laughs> a silver bullet either. But nevertheless, I still recommend having it enabled. And finally, this is my this is maybe my favorite mitigation. And that's enabling the BitLocker pin, the password that it asks before Windows starts. 
Because from an attacker perspective, the pre-boot authentication, the, the BitLocker pin, it's, it's a pain in the ass. Because what it basically means is that you only get one shot at trying this attack. You can power it off and power it on only once. So you need to get it right on the first time. If you don't have this enabled, then the attacker can try this 10 times, 100 times. The attacker can steal your laptop, do one year of research, and then one year after stealing your laptop, then he finally gets it working and has access to your hard drive. So I think this is a really good mitigation. And what's pretty ironic is that if you look at the Microsoft documentation, type of, types of attacks for volume encryption keys, so this is Microsoft's official BitLocker documentation, at the bottom of this document, they basically say that they don't really nowadays recommend having the BitLocker pin enabled because it's inconvenient, because the users need to type the pin when they start the computer. So what Microsoft is saying that if you have BIOS password and if you have secure boot enabled, you're already good. You don't need to enable the BitLocker pin. Thank you. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand high. I'm bad at demonstrating it. <laughs> There's one. Please wait for the microphone. Microphone here. Um, there should be. Organizers, uh, it's microphone. coming, I guess. Just a second. There. Yeah, so uh, essentially you said that some of the memory controllers are not vulnerable, and it, to me it seems that if you would do proper hardware random number generator for the memory scrambler key and use a proper algorithm with current knowledge, it would not be crackable. So is this what they actually have done, or what's the thing? Um, that, that's a great question. Um, one thing I, I didn't mention about the memory scrambling is that the reason why processors do memory scrambling is that they, they try to avoid problems. So let's say you write a lot of ones or a lot of zeros to the memory. You might get some sort of interference. So they are, with, with the scrambling, they are trying to make sure that the physical memory cells would have about the equal number of zeros and ones. So the memory scrambling itself is not a security feature. It's, it's a major obstacle, uh, obstacle if you want to build a real-world attack, yes, but it's not a security feature. That said, I think there are some papers about yeah. um, encrypting the memory. So Intel has a patent of doing a proper encryption on that, so the, the, the chip would actually have the key for the encryption pattern. But as, as far as we know, there are, there are no hardware available that would actually implement that. But Intel has a patent for it. Oh, okay, somebody here says that AMD is already doing it. We have not seen it in life. How many of you have an AMD processor? <laughs> okay, I used to have, I don't have anymore. It was lacking all the cool spectra and meltdown vulnerabilities, so I sold it. It wasn't James Bond compatible. <laughs> exactly. Any other questions? Any other questions? There's one. Oh, there. So <clears throat> I don't think your attack would work if you would enroll your own secure boot keys. Mm. Can you repeat the question, please? Would the, would the attack work if you rolled your own secure boot keys? That's, that's a very good question. Um, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work, but I haven't tested that yet. Just send us your hardware. <laughs> Other questions? There's one here. Uh, 
Hi. Isn't there actually a kernel patch to Linux that you can keep your encryption keys inside CPU memory instead of uh, RAM? If there is a patch like that? There is. And, I, okay, awesome. I think I um, tested it something like five years ago when this paper was published. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've heard that there are some disk encryption um, implementations that don't actually have the keys in the memory. So that's a very good point. All the disk encryption implementations that don't keep the keys in random access memory are not vulnerable. So yes, that would protect against this attack at least. What is the reason not to keep the encryption key inside CPU memory? Because CPU has a lot of memory and the key is quite short and you can keep it actually just there. <laughs> and it's that's, very hard to boot cold boot CPU memory. That's, that's a very good question. You should probably ask <laughs> Microsoft that. But yeah, valid question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. At, at, le at least it's easier to implement AES like it's done currently. It's easier. Thanks. Any other questions? Just one question at the back, at least. Uh, hi, very good presentation. I have a question about other product like the TrueCrypt or the the product are based on TrueCrypt because TrueCrypt was uh, say cancelled at the end. Um, at least I've seen academic papers where they attack TrueCrypt. Um, I haven't tested TrueCrypt myself at all, but the same principle applies. If it keeps the encryption keys in memory, it's going to be vulnerable. There's one question. Hi, and thanks for great presentation. Uh, has there been any cases where you didn't succeed to extract the keys? Or, and if so, what was the reason? Any, some practical thing or some secure? Yes, there has been multiple cases. Um, one of the reasons is that the, ver the version that we currently have, it supports only a limited set of operating systems and BitLocker configurations. Um, but those are things that obviously could be fixed by further working on the tool. Then there has been multiple laptops that at least originally didn't seem to be vulnerable for the attack. But now I'm having one problematic system that behaves in a really weird way. The attack doesn't work, and I don't quite understand why because there's many good reasons why it should. And based on the problems that I'm seeing now, I have a feeling that some of the laptops that I've tested earlier that I thought are not vulnerable might actually be vulnerable. This is almost like black magic. Yeah. So it's it's question of making the tooling more robust. We had a case where we were wondering why this wasn't working, and then we noticed that the uh, memory manager or the memory management unit was not doing scrambling at all, uh, which was a bit, <laughs> bit awkward. Um, yeah, the target was too easy for yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just left it alone. Yeah. The, all I'm saying is that there are many things that can go wrong. So it's just a question of spending more time on mm. it. But it's it it's absolutely worth saying that this attack is not a silver bullet. It doesn't work always. And implementing this is a pain. Adding new features, not that much of a pain. But so that you don't get the wrong impre impression, I mean, this doesn't work always. Timo is trying to say that it was really easy. <laughs> <laughs> this question here. OK, uh, so you wanted to do the attack uh, like on target instead of doing it off target. So was it, was it kind of for the coolness factor of playing with uh, so little memory or, or something else? Like if you could just uh, dump the memory into some external device yeah. from a little yeah. 
So uh, the thing is that it has, for us, it has multiple use cases. You can use it for uh, basically that taking a memory dump of it, uh, of a system, uh, especially if you're running Linux, because it's really, really painful there. But it, it can also be used for offensive purposes, as, as you saw on demo. So original use case was actually to use it for offensive purposes, and then later on repurpose it for for uh, digital investigations, basically. Maybe I'll share a bit of the story how the tool was born. Yeah. The, the original target was Microsoft Surface Tablet. And I was expecting that the device wouldn't have BitLocker enabled, and it would be pretty easy to like, take all the data out of the device and backdoor it and whatnot. And when I learned that it actually had BitLocker enabled, I was pretty disappointed mostly at myself, so I decided that there has to be a way of <laughs> actually hacking this device. And then I started doing some Googling, and I, I read about the code boot attacks, and I thought that, OK, that's something that would work in this case. But the original proof of concept um, was for a warm boot attack. So it's the same piece of code, uh, but what you do differently there is that you simply do a controlled soft restart, so you don't power down the device, you just do a normal restart. And for that device, it was enough to use a warm boot attack. Um, I think the device had maybe four gigabytes of memory. I got maybe one and a half gigabytes, then my tool crashed. Um, obviously, because I got only one and a half gigabytes, um, I wasn't even able to use volatility to analyze the dump, because it wasn't really a valid dump. So I ran strings on the dump, and I actually came across a PowerShell script that was used to set a unique local admin password for each device. So in the end, with that really bad proof of concept, I was able to get local admin on the device. And well, yeah, that's, that's how the development of the tool started, because I wanted to use it for a real cold boot attack. Thanks. More questions? I don't see any hand, hands from down here. How about up there? All right. Thanks for having us. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.